Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to what increasing people are calling the program, which is quite nice of them. Um, today's, I think, a really interesting uh, group of people we brought together with a few regulars, a couple of new people. Hopefully, you've all seen the notes that sent around yesterday. And um, what we need to do is to really uh, quickly talk through what's going to be happening on the program, and then uh, we run the poll, and then we will obviously, hopefully, after that, be able to. Uh, hear your questions and please put them in as we go along and then wrap up with whatever issues have emerged. But today's been, in, this week's been an interesting week. We've had the government guidelines and we will be looking at those in a bit more depth. And we've also been looking at the whole area of cross-border transactions and cross-border clients in a bit more depth. So what are the issues that you has collectively have brought to our attention? And we'll talk a bit more about styles today, this idea of having multiple styles, context-driven, um, we'll talk about ensuring all your people are in a safe work environment in a lot more depth. And then some of the issues may emerge around reputation, around winning new work from clients, maintaining team productivity, mental health, well-being. Sasha did that brilliant last week. Planning for the new normal. I think that's probably where we're at now. Strategies for communicating over channels, serving local and international clients and financial metrics. Very much not just about billing wit, but maybe client solvency is creeping in. If your client is unlikely to pay, are you really want to work for them? Good question. And time recording too. Key contract clauses, cybersecurity and phishing. But the two that I always think are really, really important are to ration your time to create space for real emergencies. It's dead easy to be busy, busy on things that aren't that important. And finally, getting everyone to realize that everyone needs some downtime and that genuinely includes you. For those who were on the call before, I apologize, but I just really love these seven strategies. So I'll just run through them again, if I may. Uh, and they really do apply to all of us in different ways. First of all, think big. As Lewis Carroll said, believe six impossible things before breakfast. You are the power of your connections, but you've got to reciprocate. It's not good enough just to uh, reach out to people. Think small, think of an angles that really resonate with whatever audiences you're trying to address or clients. Do a series, not a one-off. Uh, it's interesting how you will convert an audience into a community. We're certainly doing this on this call with 750 people registered to date. Drop the convention, do try new things and services, but don't drop the baby out with the bathwater. That's the whole innovator's dilemma. Speed is of the essence, so articulate and market test your assumptions. If they then prove invalid, amend them and pivot in a new direction. And be entrepreneurial, keep listening and innovating. Lots of people think in entrepreneurs means being innovating. It's actually about listening. Listening is more important in many ways to be entrepreneurial. And that's adapted from Elena Kutsko of Globsec and Bratislava speaking at a think tank meeting uh, last month. But thank you, Elena. I thought they were really gr seven great strategies which apply to all of us in different contexts. Next, who's on today? I'm kind of grouping them. Um, we've got Lucy Ride from the uh, Bayes but in strategy and Jeremy Beard, who's the managing partner of Hayes McIntyre. And I thought it'd be interesting if we asked them to focus a little bit on the guidelines that came out uh, this week, which hopefully most of you will have seen. Um, I sent you a link in your, excuse me, in the joining instruction, uh, produced notes were sent out yesterday. And then we have three people who have an international perspective. Uh, Francesca Lagerberg, who you know obviously by now from Grant Thornton. Uh, Helen Samaher, who is new to the uh, uh, to the, the program. Now, she and I, interesting, worked out we last saw each other 14 years ago. So, you know, relationships can stretch over a long, long period. Uh, and then Graham, who came back, who's coming back after uh, being with us once before. And then finally, another new uh, member, Richard Thorby, who's going to talk a bit about coaching and in particular, how can leaders adopt a coaching mindset and obviously yours truly. So, this is the one of the key things that we're going to be talking about today. If you haven't seen these guidelines, again, you've got the link in the in sent out. Give them a read and you'll obviously hear our views, but there's certainly something that I've got some good practical tips in. I think that's the way I'd look at it. And what I'd also want to quickly do is talk a little bit about last week's poll results now that we're going into the poll section. And I have never, I think, to be honest, found quite such a definitive set of agreements. We're talking about 94% of people agreed that the current COVID strategies, suppression strategies, remain from home, test and trace, isolate, et cetera, are gonna be around post uh, the lockdown. Working from home, you can see these numbers as well. Um, I call them planning assumptions. And what it really saying to me was that if, and we are a group of 
I'm not saying we're all the same, but we're probably a group of closer to the pragmatist early adopters than the conservatives, given that we're on the call, put it that way. Um, but that actually, for this group, if those are your planning assumptions, then it's going to be very hard, for example, for government to change your minds when you are 94% in agreement that this is going to be the way forward and therefore you're going to build your business plan and your business models around these assumptions. Um, so they're, very, they're in the management library obviously but I thought that was a really interesting poll result and thank you government for that really amazing feedback. Uh, obviously it's great to know that someone's listening and uh, the fact that Lucy's with us today is great as well. So today's poll, what are we going to, let's just run through them and you can do this yourself obviously as well but the one that uh, is 74% in terms of where marketing team are spending their time is Marcoms. Um, is that where people think they should be? Not really. Marcoms is a little bit lower, 66. And the big one is to work with firm leaders to assess the market implication of new services. And that's moved from 49% currently to 75%. So there's clearly a gap there between where marketing people are currently spending their time and where you as a group think they should be spending their time. And we'll explore that with, a, with the chart a bit later. Um, uh, that's an interesting one. Less than half of you have completed a formal risk assessment. Um, the government may have views on that. <laughs> and, uh, moving down next to assuming no vaccine, how, what proportion of your people are likely to still be working from home by the end of October 2020? Around three quarters. Uh, that's still quite a big, and 21% everyone. So we're talking 62% in total will be, will be still more than, more than people working from home. General mood is apprehensive. That's possibly, don't think anyone's very relaxed, but that's not wholly surprising, I suspect in terms of uh, returning to the office. Have you formally surveyed your people 50-50, how they feel about returning to the office is an emotional word there. Um, so half of you have, if you haven't, that's something you might wanna think about doing. Um, in terms of the furlough scheme, it's again, we'll have to compare it with last time we, we did this question, but none is by far and away the largest item. The level of dick in the, excuse me, the dip in the firm's income. Again, I'd have to look back at last time. I think it's a little bit less than it was five, six weeks ago, but I'll have to compare that. I haven't got the data in front of me. Uh, in terms of the seriousness of a second impact, you're looking at four, 44%, half of you are four to five, which is pretty serious. And in terms of confidence, ability to respond though, you are quite confident. So I think probably what I would take from that is that we've all learned quite a lot from the previous experience we could then deploy if a second wave came along. And I think that will probably reassure government. So on which happy note, I will stop sharing and I will continue to the next phase, which is to invite our first presenter to come along and to talk to us. And this is, as you probably know, is Lucy. So I'd like you to invite Lucy to come and talk a little bit about the guidelines and some of the things that government are seeing important in terms of helping our businesses cope with um, this very unusual situation we're in. Over to you. So as you've probably seen um, from the many announcements this week, um, we're moving towards a gradual reopening of businesses um, and the easing of some restrictions. Um, but again, with the important caveat that it's crucial we ensure safer working practices are adhered to. Um, so the coronavirus safer working guidance was published on Monday um, and the guidance was developed in consultation with approximately 250 businesses, unions, industry leaders, as well as devolved administrations. Um, I think you'll be pleased to hear um, the PBS sector was um, very um, heavily consulted on with this. Um, I'm not going to go into detail with the um, guidance. Um, I think Richard has shared something similar, um, but I can say that up to an extra 14 million has been made available for the health and safety executive, um, for extra call centre employees, inspectors and equipment um, to assist in the implementation of the guidance. Um, and the guidance also provides employees with a downloadable notice which businesses should display to show people they have followed the guidance. Um, another, um, I'm going to talk about a quick other announcement this week um, on the job retention scheme. Um, so it's open until the end of October. Um, the scheme will continue to apply in its current form until the end of July. Um, and again, from the start of August, furloughed workers will be able to return to work part-time, um, which I'm sure many of you will be pleased to hear. 
Um, yeah, that's all I have today. Um, I think Rich is going to share something a bit more in depth. I won't bore you with the kind of um, ins and outs of the guidance, um, but any feedback again will be appreciated um, and I can take that back and see that. Yeah, I, I think I probably won't really say very much in terms of the in-depth side. I mean, there, it covers the obvious thing. I think the key point I would make is that this is, this is non-statutory, that the yeah. lo legal obligations that we all have as employers whether it's around diversity, health and safety, and every other matter, are remaining case. Government can't just change the law. It would like, might like to want to. It can't. Law is law. So everything that you read has to be read in the context of existing obligations, which hopefully as employers you'll be at least aware of. But some of those areas, as we've discussed in previous, uh, uh, excuse me, in previous programs around diversity, for example, and equality of treatment of people, can be and perceived fairness can become much more difficult. I think when everybody's isolated. Um, Jeremy, you, you, you're the managing partner, obviously, of a, uh, an accountancy firm and uh, have many of these issues that you're dealing with on a day to day basis. Um, do you want to kind of give your reflections on the guidelines and talk to us about some of the issues that you think are particularly pertinent to this audience of, I would say, mainly, well, CEO, CEO C-suite, probably mainly mid-sized firms of the group who come onto this program, as we know from previous uh, occasions. Over to you, sir. Sure. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everyone. And I hope everyone is, is keeping well. Um, thank you very much, Lucy, for, for that update and, and for the guidelines, which I think are extremely helpful. Um, and, and certainly we are starting to work our way through them. I suppose, um, just for those of you that don't know, we are um, a firm of about 350 people and we're in a single office location in central London. I think it's important just to give that context. So, so we only have one office to, to, to think about, which is, which is good. Um, I think some of the challenges for us will be around um, dealing with other tenants within our building and dealing with the landlord and the common areas and, and making sure that whilst we, can, whilst we can deal with our own space, in our own office, obviously, there's the, the, there's other areas of the building, other access points, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which we've got to make sure we're comfortable with. I think at this stage, um, we still see any return to the office of any sort um, quite quite some time off. Um, we did say to all our staff a week ago that we would give them at least a month's notice with regard to any return to the office. Um, and, and frankly, from my point of view at the moment, I, I don't see that being any time soon. Um, so we are working through these guidelines. We're working through our risk assessment and, and we're looking at all of that. But we do feel it's probably still some, some time away before there's any sort of return to the office. We haven't done our staff survey yet, but that will go out next week. And in addition to looking at the return to office aspects, we're obviously looking at what people might like to see in the future as well. So how have they found working from home? How have they found working remotely? As well as then, how do they feel about return to the office? What are the issues they have? But also, how, how do they see themselves? How would they like to see themselves working in the future? So we're hoping that that survey will capture a number of areas around the current situation and, and future, future working. Um, I think a challenge continues to be communication with our staff and maintaining our culture and maintaining our values. It's a lot more difficult to do that um, when we're all working remotely. Um, so we're, we're con we continue to be mindful of that. Those of you listening a couple of weeks ago will have heard me mention about our big Hayes McIntyre event, which we did um, about 10 days ago now, which was fantastic, fantastic fundraiser. But as well, it was it, it was great in terms of getting the whole team together. We had 240 of our 350 staff participate in that event on one day, which was brilliant. And, and every it just really lifted people. So I'd encourage people to to think about what you can do to get all the team working together and feel part of that team, even though we're working remotely. Um, I think those are the, the main points. I think perhaps also just to flag, you know, the workplace guidance 
great and we're working on that but i think still and we'll see from our staff survey when it comes back the major issue for most people in london is the commute and the travel and how they're going to handle that so i i think that's 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 a big factor we can have the we can get the office all absolutely sorted but the commute is still a major concern for a lot of people thank you yeah, I, I think a lot of people noticed people being coming in and out of the buses and uh, that was not something that I think people were very positive seeing the other day in the, in the news. Maybe it was an isolated incident, but at the end of the day, it forms impressions, as they say. OK, uh, thank you, Lucy. And thank you, Jeremy. That was really helpful. Um, as I said, do look at the guidelines. They're there. They're free, obviously. Um, there's a poster that comes with them that you can stick up in the office as and when you have an office. But going back to our poll, that maybe as Jeremy's said some not not any time soon uh right i'd now like to slightly switch the topic if i may and we're going to focus a little bit more on cross-border and i would like to invite francesca to come and give her take as to how do you how does an organization that has cross-border clients <coughs> serve those clients and perhaps even harder find new ones thank you richard good morning everybody or afternoon if you're in a different part of the world um Let's look at some of the humanity points, I think, right at the beginning about international trade. So about an hour and a half ago, I was chatting to one of my colleagues who has just moved uh, from Australia back to Hong Kong, which is where they work from. And they were on a, one of the flights, a commercial flight, which has since stopped flying from Australia to Hong Kong, but a couple of weeks ago was flying. So every day he has to check in on the app that sits on his phone. He's in 14 days quarantine. Uh, that will get lifted sometime next week. He has on his wrist, he's got a, a little tracker and that beeps every 90 minutes. And if he does a lot of exercise in his apartment, he gets a phone call saying, you seem to be very active. Have you left your flat? Utterly fascinating. How do you go about doing international trade when it, you really are going to struggle to move from country to country in the short term? Hugely challenging. You, know, you, uh, you can't really ask people to go and do a business trip. It's a three day business trip with two weeks either side of it so you can see how international trade is going to shrink in terms of the people piece but in terms of the actual doing trade internationally there's still lots going on lots and lots of people are working across borders much as they've ever done but it's obviously impacting on the supply chain uh, there's issues around items of going across borders and in our knowledge-based industry in our in the world that that we all work in professional services there are challenges around money coming in and out of countries around access to information and still a lot of issues around actually getting on site in a safe way to do some of the work that needs to happen on site. So this week I've talked to about 20 CEOs, different parts of the world, and there is a quite a divide between the East and the West. Um, in the West, you've got a lot of countries still struggling with what coming out of lockdown looks like. What does that feel like? How do you manage your people? How do you manage your clients? What do you do? And then in parts of the East, a little bit of normality returning. So you, know, you can actually go out on the street, there's a lot of businesses opening, but even now it's, uh, it's not as it was back in January or February. So there is this concept we keep talking about on these calls around new normal. What really is that? And the honest answer is no one yet knows. But I've been fascinated by the working from home piece that's coming through very strongly in your poll, Richard, and also in what Jeremy uh, was saying earlier on and the government was saying people quite like working from home when they can. Not everybody. And it's hugely challenging for quite a few people. But if they can actually work from home and it's a pleasant experience, they're not that keen about going back into the office. And that has massive implications for the property you have, the way that you work, your technology and how you're set up to work effectively. I want to share, I want to share just a couple of survey results, uh, not from something in Europe or, or in the UK, but from the FDC. The FDC are an international business school. They're based in Brazil. Um, they're always ranked in the top 10 business schools around the world. And, and I happen to sit on their international advisory committee. So um, I just saw this information. So the great conference they ran this week. They, they looked just at Brazil uh, to get some info. A third of people in Brazil in their survey had never ever worked from home before, before the pandemic. Now, of course, at least 95% of Brazil is working from home. They think that their productivity is pretty much the same and in some cases better. And over 50% of the people surveyed said, I don't want to go back to working in an office, either because they're frightened about the implications 
or actually they're preferring working from home as their norm rather than uh, than any other reason. Utterly fascinated to see how people's uh, views around what work really looks like and in our professional services world when much work can be done in a different way how do you have that engagement how do things change so last point from me Richard um, I think if you've got very good relationships with your clients with your own people it's actually been quite easy to do some of the things that we do uh, that haven't involved needing to be on site uh, but when you don't know someone and you're creating a new client relationship or you're investing in a, a in, in a new service with a new bunch of people that still is pretty challenging when you're doing it electronically so new normal who knows where it's going to fall but fascinating to see right around the world people are struggling with these same issues and what the future might look like that, that's all from me richard and the answer of course is that none of us know and anybody who thinks they do know uh, you should probably step uh, carefully walk on by because we're in that world helena um helena's new uh, to the call as i think i mentioned and she is the uh, president and CEO of Lex Monday, which in many ways has many similarities to Grant Thornton. Uh, it's trading under the same brand, Lex Monday, and it's uh, about 100, I think, um, but she can correct me on that. Um, independent uh, law firms, um, which are brought together under the Lex Monday barrier, but are all independent firms. Helena, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. And great to see you after 14 years, Richard. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, joining all of you today. Uh, as Richard mentioned, uh, Lex Mundi, we are uh, an, a membership association. Our members are all law firms, they're independent law firms, uh, and they are required to be among the largest firms and top tier firms in their jurisdictions. Um, so I just thought I would share with you a little bit uh, what we have done in terms of responding to the current situation, both internally, but more importantly with our members and our clients. Uh, I think for the network itself, um, many of our initiatives that were already actually underway uh, have actually served us well uh, because we had already implemented a program of making our business more digitally future-proof. And so as we came into the crisis, we realized that what was important was for us to accelerate those measures, but there wasn't really anything uh, that came as a shock. And that even includes uh, that I had implemented a working from home uh, policy upon joining the organization, which was just a year ago. Uh, we also shifted all of our communications to video con uh, conferencing. So a lot of things that we had underway uh, are now accelerating and assisting us through this situation. Uh, in terms of our members and their clients, uh, we set up a COVID-19 hub uh, on our website within about a week of the kickoff of the crisis and that has served us and our clients extremely well. Uh, so it's a very rich resource center. Uh, within also about five days we were able to put together a 105 country uh, government uh, support measures report which our uh, members embraced and shared with all of their clients and we've had a tremendous response to that. And so obviously that is now being updated weekly and it is uh, also a dynamic formatted report. So we came online very quickly with a wide range of COVID-19 uh, resources for members and clients. And that has actually also helped uh, accelerate uh, some of our work. And, uh, you know, we are a lot more, people used to think, you know, Lex Mundi is a directory book, it's a listing or it's a conference event organizer, but actually, in the last seven years, a lot of the work that we focus on now is in supporting client development work uh, for our members. We support global you know, RFPs and pitches all the time. So we are, for many of our firms, we are their international strategy. And so we're very active on the client front as well, which is why we focus very quickly on that COVID-19 hub and some of the, the multi-country uh, pieces of work that we're doing. Uh, we also, as this is a managing partners uh, forum, uh, we started very early on with managing partner calls. We have a managing partners committee, as you can imagine, and it's a group that meets regularly. But in the context of uh, COVID and what we did, just picking up on Francesca's East and West, uh, if you like, divide uh, point, we, we launched uh, a series of managing partner calls and we had panels from each of our regions uh, speaking uh, to their issues and their responses in their region. And it actually was very interesting to see sort of when the response began and what it looked like in the east and how it then flowed across our, our various uh, regions so that's something that uh, the managing partners have really welcomed that level of exchange and collaboration has served them well and sort of the the, the, the dominoes effect from the east uh, to the west but by and large i would say 
um, as Francesca echoed, you know, we are fortunate as professional service providers to be able to work from remotely. Uh, we have been using digital resources and our clients are actually also, you know, uh, I'm a former general counsel for many years. I worked as a global GC. You know, that focus on technology and digital tools is very significant in, in our client communities as well. And so I think that does help uh, provide a lot of continuity in terms of working uh, with client across borders. Uh, clearly, as, as Francesca said, you know, finding new clients might be a little bit more difficult. But within the Lex Mundi world, this is actually what the referral system does for many of our firms. And so there are a lot of firms that get new work for new clients because that work generates in, certain, in one part of the network and flows to the other. And we are seeing quite a lot of uh, our firms are busy with distressed m and They're busy uh, with litigation. They're busy with employment. Um, and so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, if this thing starts to come a little bit under control, you know, it will have been a rough patch, but gradually, I hope, uh, I'm an optimist by nature, I hope that the business levels will be maintained and staff will remain in place. And that's it for me. Thank you, Helena. That was uh, interesting. And Helena's actually in France at the moment, which is um, interesting because the fact that we can bring people together across frontiers for the purpose of this call as well is indicative of this. The, some of the benefits possibly of the uh, of the current absolutely context. i'm a londoner through and through but i'm just at the, just currently in france at the moment um, but very much a londoner very good graham come and talk uh, tell us about your perspectives on what you've been hearing today today on the call and other matters and graham incidentally is not just the uh, chair of the non-exec directors association he's also uh, actively involved as a non-exec director with a number of accountancy uh, major firms Richard, thank you, and uh, hello everybody, and Richard, thank you for inviting me again. Um, I, I found it fascinating, I, particularly I was listening to Francesca's story about um, what's happening elsewhere in the world, and one of the things I think is it's, it's dangerous if we just see the world through our own, uh, through our UK prism. I think that's the point we were trying to make, Francesca, really. We have to, when we're planning our way out of this, we've got to look, both learn from what other people are doing, um, but also under um, maybe feedback. It's a, it's a two-way process. Um, I, I sit on boards, we advise boards, we advise um, accounting, audit, or information. The organizations we, we work with have between, I was looking down at it just now, between 40 and 46,000 people. Um, so let's just talk about what's happening in the boardrooms that, that, we, that, that we as the uh, in my kind of professional life and in my non-exec life um, I'm involved in. Um, and and I, was, I was thinking of, uh, yesterday morning I was on a call with people from both Germany and from China. Um, and they were both in their offices. And they, they weren't, they weren't, you know, having to, they didn't have any issue of getting to the offices and they were both in their offices. So, you know, it's, it's a different world out there in different places. Um, for those of them that were in the offices, we were, we were talking, I was, it was a board of quite a large organization, and we were, we were talking about what I call the 10 C's. I don't propose going through the 10 C's with everybody today, but I'll give you some of them. Um, the focus in, in the boardroom was around cash, of course. You know, have we got our credit lines, et cetera, et cetera? Are we making certain people recall working program, all that stuff? Um, it's interesting Richard's coming on later to talk, I think, about coaching because the second thing was coaching. And then we were coaching around the board, but also the need to cascade coaching down uh, throughout the whole organization. Uh, the third thing we were talking about, interestingly, was the composition of the board itself that we were sitting at and considering whether actually it was appropriate. Um, and I was, Richard, I was fascinated by your um, survey early on that said that 74% of people thought it's important that marketing was there in the boardroom challenging, but only 40% of, 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 of in the businesses were actually doing it. And, um, and I thought that was a, you know, so who sits in that boardroom? Um, I thought the, the fourth thing is the comprehension. You know, do we actually understand what's going on out there? Back to my point of danger if we just see the world through our own kind of local prism. Um, I've, I've spoken about the concept of, well, maybe I haven't, but I think there is a need to cascade the thoughts from the board throughout the organization. 
there's this communication point, this cascade point. I don't say communication, I say cascade, because I want it, I want it to be everybody to be involved. And a link back, Richard, to your point about coaching. You know, a cascading coaching uh, approach through a business is incredibly valuable. If you haven't got one at this time, you, you're going to be missing it. And, um, and if you can put one in very fast, then, then my view is that you should. Um, the client, of course, is, focused, is the key focus to all this. But what does the client actually want? And that my view is that the client wants consistent quality. And that's consistent quality in everything, absolutely everything. I can see Helena um, nodding and uh, there, but, but it, I think it's fundamental. It's a bit of a challenge, actually, consistent quality. And Richard, I think you were referring to it in a network. It's, it's, it's a huge challenge because you've got disparate ownership around the world. And one of the challenges that networks deal with is how to ensure that you get consistent quality despite the fact you've got disparate ownership. Um, the big four sorted out, of course, because they get such huge levels of referrals between their practices that everybody has a vested interest in abiding by the, um, by the quality rules. In the, but below that, you, it can be, and, and certainly some of the networks that I, I listen to, they talk about the, the irritation that they find in having some people that aren't following the rules. Um, in the integrated partnerships, for example, the Zars, who I'm, many people will know I advise, um, it is easier in there because, of course, it is one partnership. But this, this, the way that you get consistent quality is going to become incredibly important as we emerge, particularly where you can't actually go and impose the quality yourself. You're stuck, for example, in the UK and you get out, can't get out to, to look at the quality in Greece or to look at the quality in China or to look at the quality in the US. You have to rely upon other people. So um, what, do I, what do I think is really important from a board perspective at the moment? I think the coaching piece that Rich is going to talk about later, I think, is incredibly important. I think a comprehension about what's going on around the world and not just, just locally is actually incredibly important, both to, uh, because you can learn from it if nothing else. And, and I think this, this focus on consistent quality is absolutely essential. Um, and as a result of all of that, boards are changing, where we are seeing people being taken off boards, we're seeing more people coming onto boards. Typically at this stage, one would expect it, Richard, to be, um, you'd be typically losing the marketing people off the board and putting the cost cutters on. Um, interestingly, the more, I think, f far, kind of far thinking boards are thinking about what happens when this, this ends, you know, we're in it, now what's going to happen when we come out of it. Yeah, and it's interesting, there are people who are now saying this is the best possible time to plan. Um, the future is always uncertain anyway. You have different scenarios, but now is the time to actually start planning for them. Uh, Richard, talk to us a little bit about um, the coaching and how we actually can as leaders take advantage of the coaching so thank you very much Richard thank you for this opportunity to um, to share a little um, about a week ago Richard asked me to do one of the expert um, sessions on what's called developing a coaching mindset and um, <clears throat> what I'm presenting today is very much a um, um, a summary of that so anybody who might be mildly interested in what I say today is welcome to go and look on um, the Managing Partners Forum website to be able to see um, that presentation. The reason I'm here today um, firstly is because I'm a director of the Managing Partners Forum and looking after all the peer groups and secondly because for the last 10 years I've been on the journey of uh, learning how to be an executive coach. I only work in the professional service firm space. I have thousands of hours of doing this. And Richard said, okay, could you share something that may be of value to um, our members? So um, the first thing I wanted to say that if there is, um, you know, very, very much part of what we do in terms of the coaching is help people go on a learning journey together. You co-create a learning experience such that people frame solutions better than they could do on their own. Um, it's not like football coaching. Um, it's very much by using a, a, a tool set that helps people through questions and, and extreme listening to help people to frame solutions that are better. Um, leadership in a professional service home can be a very lonely space. And so over the years, I've spent a lot of time with leaders 
um, and had a lot of very privileged conversations. Um, on the basis that let's help people go on a learning journey, um, I wanted to commend one article to you it's done by Harvard Business School. It's titled Leadership That Gets Results. It's by Daniel Goleman. Um, it's one of the most helpful uh, articles that I've observed in 10 years of doing this. And the reason it's helpful is, first of all, because first of all, it starts speaking about the phenomena of emotional intelligence. It starts to paint a picture that professional healthy professional service firms are infused with um, high EQ interactions, EQ being emotional intelligence summary, and it's part of an embedded culture. So in a sense, it's the opposite of the, of the virus situation in the sense that it's a positive virus. So if you think of viroli virology, we're all learning about R0 and R1 and R2. You want to encourage a very high, high R um, uh, factor within your firms because you're in fact in positively infecting everybody and it's called the network effect of influence. And of course, that network effect of influence goes on into the client environment. Um, I have trained a lot of and helped a lot of partners of professional service firms. Their clients have become addicted to them because they've learned how to coach their clients. The second main insight on emotional intelligence is this amazing insight is that you can't teach it to professionals. I've tried it is almost impossible the reason is if you've got high cognitive high iq um, individuals what they do is they learn about it as a concept they can regurgitate it and it doesn't change their lives at all so i'm going to reflect on um, leave you to ponder that i'll come back to in a little bit later the other reason this article is so helpful is because um, it teaches that great leadership is not about a unitary style of leadership it's about generating a, a, a portfolio of leadership styles and then learning how to adapt those styles to the context. So in professional service firms, the coaching leadership style is pr proved to be extremely helpful, um, but also challenging because you grow up as a professional, I'm a chartered accountant, you're very much there to offer advice and things like that. But when you start learning from the coaching perspective and looking to lead a firm on that basis, you've got to shift psychologically from adding value from what you know to saying, no, the greatest thing I can offer another human being is to go on a learning journey with them, helping them to find the incisive question in their lives and then helping them to implement high quality solutions. And if you can do that throughout the organization and if you can get your leaders to do that, of course, as you appreciate that, produces an amazing culture within the firm. It also is the way to enhance um, human capital development within the firm. So as to this point of why you can't teach EQ to professionals and to clever professionals, um, what I learned over years, so I'm hoping that this one insight will save somebody hours and also money. You can't train professionals in any EQ competences. What you have to do is train them to be coaching leaders. Because when you train them to be a coaching leader, they have to ha pick up the experience of, of, of emotional intelligence. So the first time I did this years ago with a partner, experimenting, shifting from instructing them to, um, to being with them, I said to them, coach me now. And their face went white. They grabbed their pad and their pen <laughs> as their comfort blanket as a professional. And that's the journey we started together until they got extraordinarily competent. The other thing I've learned is that the coaching mindset or the coaching project is actually a philosophy of life. And therefore has done immense amounts in my life to reduce the stress in my life because it's, quiet, it's quietened me, it slowed me down. Secondly, it's reduced the conflict in my life because um, I'm not busy asserting a view. I'm busy questioning and asking a collective what is the question that we're seeking to answer here today? A little bit about what Graham was saying in the board, a great Ned is the person who can graciously ask the incisive question in a moment. So what I wanted to do just to prove this, so that not only do I can I instruct, but also give you a learning experience. Can I invite you for one or two minutes just to go on this little exercise? So everybody on the call, 
pen and paper, as it were, or um, as an um, as a, um, intellectual um, thought exercise. Here's a question for you, because it's about the value of the incisive question. What is the problem you are currently seeking to solve? So in your firm or in your life? And I'd like to see 20 seconds of my time to you thinking about that and in some way answering it in your own mind. So my next question, is it the right problem? And then the next question, if it's not, then what is the right problem? Now in my coaching experiences, that loop can take an hour because where people start is not where they end up. Also, it's a gift to every leader in this firm, uh, of the firms on the call, because now go away and go to your FD and say, what is the problem you're trying, seeking to solve? And then is it the right problem? And then deal with your head of HR and then deal with each of your functional heads. And this is the way that you can start to make the adjustment from managing the firm towards leading the firm. Secondly, making sure the firm is um, populated with the important rather than the urgent. Um, there are lots of questions. I will leave um, a list for Richard, but um, I wanted to, to spend one other thought that has come out of this coaching um, uh, journey I've been on. And it's this, because I've spent so much time in professional service firms now. And it's the question, why is it so difficult for professionals to think together? If you take 10 people, put them in a round a table, each of them have got an um, IQ of 130, and then get them to interact, and you watch the average IQ systematically decline. And so I guess I wonder one another, a question for the readers today is, what's the one thing you could do to encourage a thinking environment within your leadership teams? Because if you can think together, you can learn together. If you can learn together, then you can change and gain a competitive advantage fr from that. Um, lastly, I would um, just a reflection for every strategist um, in terms of an incisive question, maybe something like this. Um, and this came from my business school experiences, and it's one that stayed with me. If you were starting your firm for the first time today, what would you be doing differently? Because that's the competitive view. It's not only the competitive view, it's also the, the person that's really going to eat your breakfast, who's a firm that is VC sourced and is not in your sector and doesn't give, have any respect for your sector, but can very much enter very quickly and on a different basis. My last thought for today is um, what's, just a, just a question, what's the average time from research you think it takes for professionals to recover from burnout. An amazing thing is the research shows between, it's between three years and never. And so my invitation for you today in terms of thinking is one, are you looking after yourself? Are you resting? And are you demonstrating a leadership style that gives permission to your um, organizations to rest? Um, I say to many leaders, tell people when you're resting and then communicate that throughout the firm. I have never in the last 10 years seen so many fried, borderline burnout people. You have so many diligent people working for your firms. And the trouble is at the moment is they're working 24-7. So I would leave that as an invitation and hand it back to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes less now. We've got lots of questions that have come in. Um, <clears throat> seems to me there's quite a few for you, Jeremy, if you'd like to just run through under the answered tab and just talk a little bit about the question and then also what the issue was that you, uh, how you responded, that would be really good. Do you want to give the question because people won't be able to see it if you just want to explain oh, what the sorry, question is. That... Sorry, can Jeremy say a little bit, a little bit more about Hayes McIntyre event? What did it actually involve and how did you get such high participation? 
we um, we spent our hours exercise on one particular day. We all uh, walked or ran for an hour and we collated all the distances of, of every individual to try and get us from Land's End to John O'Groats. We actually got to the Faroe Islands, I believe, which was a, a great achievement. But but that was the that that was the, the the event, and it was a great way for us all to come together. Um, somebody asked me about whether furloughed staff were involved in that event, and I'm pretty sure they were and did participate. Some of them. Well, I think the point. I mean, maybe Francesca might want to deal with this one because you kind of answered it. But Rosalind's question around. Uh, heightened risk in people possibly then uh, mm. being less prof more, more likely to be negligent or I think it's probably the, the right way of expressing yeah. it. Yeah no happy to pick up on that. Be some t do look at the Q&A there's some fantastic questions in there. Um, the, the, the question was if people are working at home does that impact on the risk management perhaps they're not being as well supervised maybe they would do things that would normally go through a more traditional uh process driven approach would they would they stop doing the things that you would do when you were sitting in the office and i i think the uh, you know good organizations tend to have really robust safeguarding and uh, people shouldn't who are sitting at home working from their kitchen table shouldn't be ignoring that might need a little bit of re-education if you're if you're getting worried that people aren't following those processes but um, you can, you're always reimagining your, your, the way that you manage your risk. So are there things that you need to do slightly differently to remind people that just because they're operating, uh, perhaps in their tracksuit bottoms and their, and their football t-shirt, that it's the same as sitting in the office, the same kind of robustness. So hopefully people can, uh, can do a lot of what they do uh, uh, when they were sitting in the office, do it from home in just as rigorous and as thoughtful way. And it may just need uh, a little reminder around any areas where people are getting concerned that that risk management is slightly slipping because quality is king in professional services as you know and so uh, hugely important that people keep doing that. Um, Graham you, you've answered the question from um, well anonymous attendee um, as I said that people on the call might be able to see it but they won't be able to see it on the video do you want to just quickly talk about the whole issue of productivity of younger people and how you keep them engaged that would be really helpful. Yeah I, I mean I <coughs> I have a very, very strong view about this, and that is that most professional services firms actually behave irresponsibly in respect to their youngsters. Um, it's, and, it, and, it's, um, and, and, and by that, I don't mean that they, they do it deliberately. Um, it, it's almost a kind of accidental. The best professional services firms, in my experience, and I also run, and I have to declare an interest, I also run training businesses. Um, the best professional services firms that I come across training every single person in the whole organization in the knowledge of the same core skills. And I'm talking here about soft skills, not hard skills. And by that, I mean things like how to lead, the theory of leadership, the theory of selling, the theory of uh, coaching, the theory of negotiating, the theory of strategy, etc. cetera. And, <clears throat> and then what they do is they take their top people and it was interesting, Francesca, I picked up that both you and I are trained as coaches, actually. And, um, and they train their top people um, both as coaches and they encourage them to receive coaching. And then that coaching concept cascades through the whole organization so that then people are encouraged to use the knowledge that they've been trained in and it's applied in an appropriate way throughout the organization. So, <clears throat> and for example, um, Deloitte, had a, a very good um, graduate uh, training scheme where they trained all their people in sales on that course. And that course paid for itself because these youngsters went out and sold. And I remember talking to the person running it and they said, no, it didn't cost me anything. <laughs> it was paid for by the sales that these bright young people brought in. And I think there's this kind of concept, often it's a tiered approach through some professional services, but by no means all that only the, those people sell and those people deliver and those people just basically are learning. And, and I think there's a, that there is an opportunity to use some of the extraordinary abilities of the youngsters. And actually, they'll get frustrated if you don't use them. Okay, uh, that was great. Thanks so much, Graham. Helena, um, we've obviously um, heard your words of wisdom. To what extent when a firm is uh, joining Lex Mundi, are you looking into these inverted commas, management issues. How important is that for you? 
Thank you, Richard. So actually, going back to what Graham said earlier, you know, quality and consistency of quality, this is the absolute bedrock of membership. Uh, we have, uh, you heard me say earlier, our firms are required to be the largest firms in top tier, but behind the top tier qualification, there is a very long list of very stringent criteria that are supposed to be met in order to become members. A membership is reviewed on a regular basis, so, and, and that's very, very important. And this is my first year with the organization. Every year, between 25 and 30 firms are coming up for review. And it is just uh, uh, an incredibly detailed and rigorous uh, process. Sometimes firms are not renewed. Uh, they can be renewed on shorter terms because there are conditions to be met. And we have a, a, a service standards and a charter that actually really get into the guts of the member firms in terms of you know, their people, the way they work, the way they respond to clients, cybersecurity standards. So we are very, very involved in the inner workings of our firms that want to be members and they need to continue to meet uh, or adapt, adapt to higher standards as we develop them in order to remain in the membership. And this is absolutely critical because I do think what's very important uh, in all of what's going on now, and I'm just gonna put my general counsel hat on for a moment, is not to lose sight of the clients, right? Um, you know, there's never a, a time as good as a crisis to remember that relationships matter and they're supposed to endure. Um, and it's very important, in my opinion, uh, more than ever to be speaking to clients to ask how we can help them uh, of course, we want bills to be paid. Of course, we want new business. But, you know, this is a crisis and there will be an aftermath. And I, and I personally am saying to our member firms, you know, speak to your clients, see how you can help them. Um, you know, make sure you're responding to their needs around technology, delivery, uh, you know, resource. You know, if, if you have people that you are paying for that are not busy enough, put them on a pro bono scheme in your client's organization maybe and see how you can help them because this is going to come back and be a benefit in the long term. And so I am always, you know, despite the role that I'm in now, I'm always the, the voice of the client as well because of my past experience. And I think this, this crisis is gonna be a test. It's gonna test uh, firms and how they deal with this. Thank you very much. Um, well, we've <clears throat> hit the med magic 10 o'clock. Um, so it's my chance to, uh, thank everybody who's been on the call today for their contribution as always it's been a really interesting insightful session um, for those of you who aren't familiar with our management library uh, you can find all the videos in there and what you may find is that actually uh, if you go in now there's actually some new headings around finance and ops firm wide leaders and what we've done is we have actually now uh, extended into a the member only section and this is a quick snapshot if you want to see. So you've got videos, you've got uh, the topics coming up and a little bit about the, the groups that we have. So there's quite a lot going on below the surface for those who are perhaps are less familiar with the Managing Partners Forum itself. In terms of the next uh, Hear From Experts, uh, James Cortis Pond came on uh, two or three -ish episodes ago and talked about uh, supplier spend. So we're gonna ask him to talk about that in a bit more depth because as we put it, if you can, if you have a 25% margin and you, uh, reduce your cost by one pound, you have to earn at least four pounds of additional revenue to achieve the same impact on the profitability of the business. It's quite a simple metric, but it, people overlook that. And so we're going to explore that one in a bit more depth. Um, amazing feedback as always. Thank you. Um, I can't really compete. Compulsive viewing, clapping for the NHS and logging onto your webinar. Um, thank you. Unprompted feedback as well. And to hope you found today valuable, uh, please recommend your peers. And perhaps first time I've said this, but please consider supporting our work by joining the forum. At the end of the day, we are there for you, but we also have a milk bill to pay too. So please think about joining the forum because at the end of the day, we think that what we're trying to do is something that is important. And that's really where we find our energy and positivity from. So thank you to the panel. Thank you to everybody and have a great day. Bye for now.